Hey there, this is Jay. And if you've been listening to the show for the last few weeks, then you already know. But I just want to make sure because the end of this month is soon approaching. And along with it, registration will be closing for my year-long teacher training program starting in January. My idea for this program is that it is co-creative and based in relationships. And as the inaugural group is coming to its culmination, I've enjoyed recording this series of mini-talks with people who participated so we can discuss how the process has been, celebrate our practice together, and also share something about the training for anybody else out there who might be interested. Today, I talk with Purusha. Can you hear me okay, Jay? I can. Hi, Purusha. Oh, hi. How are you? I'm doing okay, all things considered. How about yourself? A uh, bit the same, really, um, but things are fine. Things are fine. Well, thank you for setting this time aside for us to say a little something about the training. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Especially because you hold a very, like, distinguished title in my book. I don't even, I think I may have mentioned this to you before, but I've done a number of these talks with people from the training now. Yeah. And there's a pretty wide spectrum in terms of previous experience someone has had practicing with me (laughs) or being in some kind of relationship with me prior to doing the trainings, you know, from some people who had no experience at all, just listening to the podcast yeah. To varying degrees. And you are the person who has attended more live stream classes of mine than any other human being on the planet. Wow. Is that the case? It I really know I've is. done a lot, but that, that's amazing. Well, you see, I started doing online yoga classes maybe coming on seven years ago. You've been coming for maybe the last four or so, I think. Something like that. Yes, it is. And of I know who's shown up and, you know, who's had the subscription and not necessarily shown up. Yeah. And without a doubt, you have been in attendance more than any other person. Well, that's amazing. It's become really important to me. And also, Miller, my wife, who's been, you know, doing it alongside me all this time. Yes. You know, I know what it is to... I don't know, attend somebody's class that regularly. And I know how much you end up seeing a teacher, you know, on yeah. the, all kinds of days. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and vice versa. <laughs> yes. But I think for me, it, it, I feel a certain vulnerability with you in a very good way. Um, okay. Be, because of that, you know, and so having you in the training has been very special for me in that regard, uh, because you you have seen me for so many years prior to doing the training. Yes, and, and I've seen, you know, what you do shift in little ways that are quite significant as well. Well, it's interesting to hear you say that. You're also in a particular position to answer a question that I have about the training that is maybe the most significant question, honestly, because... okay. Before I made it, the conversation that Josh and I had was why? Why are we making this training? Because it couldn't be just because I needed to make money. It had to have a real reason for it. Like, And he was like, what can someone get from doing this training with you that they can't get just from coming to your live stream classes and going to teacher's call? Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. I, and I thought, well, I think that there are things that I don't, always talk about certain topics, certain material, certain conversations that I think only would happen if someone wanted to have them with me, you know, like yeah, someone yeah. would need to ask me to take on a certain role to, to do that with them. And that's what I thought the training was about. So I guess having not only been in my live stream classes more than anybody else, but you also did meet me in person and come to one of my weekend workshops what do you think the training has brought for you beyond just practicing with me through those other mediums? Okay, what, what, what's important is, is, if you like, the context and depth. Because, I mean, doing the training, 
I didn't expect to learn specifically any more about the, you know, the practice that we do together mm. that we've been doing for the past sort of like four years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because we, I, you know, I'd end up, ended up doing it in quite some depth of exploring myself in relation to the practice that, that, that you put out. But what's been important is the depth and the context. Because what yoga, you know, I've been practicing yoga since, well, longer than you have, <laughs> although I haven't been doing it consistently. Um, but what's been important for me is to learn more about the context, about how it all hangs together. You know, I've done a lot of reading on the, the text, a lot of thought and study on the philosophy. I've done a number of different styles of of physical yoga, of asana. I've done a lot of meditation, a great deal of meditation. But somehow what I was looking for was a, almost like a container to hold the whole thing together, to bring it together, to bring the relationships between the people on it, but also the different aspects of yoga, and to see that those different aspects coming back and doing something to me in my life. You had mentioned that you had always thought about potentially teaching yoga, but never thought to do it. And as you said, you were already fully educated on yoga in, in many yeah. ways prior yeah, yeah, to yeah. doing the training with me, you know? So I guess, do you feel at all more like, you could teach a yoga class if you wanted to or closer to that? And if so, what what was the missing part other than the context? Like, is there some other part of it that might enable someone to want to teach or something? I, I do feel confident in, in teaching because I feel a lot more confidence in myself. So what I, I feel I've moved beyond is just following what someone else is doing. So, I mean, I've been to a lot of yoga studios around here and in previous uh, parts of my life, but I've always been just doing what the teacher does. And the issue has been getting the confidence to move beyond that. And funny enough, doing the training has helped me to understand the process that you teach in, in you know in a, in a yoga practice but also to get the confidence in myself to make it a lot bigger to include a lot more of what i know in terms of meditation and chanting and uh, pranayama and all the things i know about that have become deeper in the course that i i've ended up in my personal practice if you like putting together a practice which is different from the one we do online, mm. uh, but includes a lot of meditation and some chanting. And I continue to explore that. But now I have the confidence that it all hangs together, that it all lives in a context, and that I'm happy about just moving from one aspect to another and changing it and feeling that I could sit down with anyone, either one-to-one -one or with a group, and actually take them through what I've developed in yoga. Oh, that answers the question perfectly for me, because what I heard you describing is that you you cultivated what we talked about as a personal practice. Yes. Where you said you're not following along with what other teachers are saying to do necessarily, but you have your own practice. And... I think that is where you teach from. That's sort of like my whole concept and that when you have that basis, that's where you feel that confidence that you could do that with anybody. Um, I guess my curiosity about that then is you have a personal practice and yet you also come and do my practice that I yeah. offer in the live streams. How does like that regular practice of doing kind of my thing help serve your personal practice? Oh, that, that's a very interesting question. Doing the practice with you, I have to be honest, takes me to a completely different space. 
Mm. Um, it's become like a, a meditation for me. So it's like chanting 108 triambicans. I don't have to think about it, and yet I do think about it, but I, what I think about is myself in it and my relationship with it to it, my relationship to the movement and the breathing. But the more I do it, the more I do it without any thought whatsoever. And it makes such a difference to me. And it helps me to understand what I want to get to in my personal practice, which is that same, uh, if you like, depth of, of understanding of what I'm doing. Because, I mean, I, I no longer look at the video when I'm doing the practice with you. I don't need to. I just, I just <laughs> But you still to like to be there live. That's so... Uh, wh oh, what is yeah. Because well, it's because different it, than just it, watching or going along to the video, even if you're not looking at it. Like, some would say, oh, what's yeah, the yeah, difference? Because, but, well, because it's different every time. It's not just every week. Every, yeah. every session is different. You're different. <laughs> yes. I'm different. Sometimes... You know, I'm really tired and, and I have to think my way through it in a different way. Sometimes I'm full of energy and I'm really going beyond it in my mind. And often you're different. You know, you, yes. you're, you're, yes. you're excited and sometimes you're, you know, almost depressed. A bit yes, sad some days. <laughs> and that, but, in, but understanding that is fabulous in developing an idea of practicing with others because it's understanding that when I do practice with others, teaching others, I will always be different. They will always be different. And it, it's seeing how it can find a way of just being with that flow of practicing yoga. So it's not something you just do each session the same um, even if the physical movement's the same, it's completely different. And I love that. I love it. Well, I love that you get that about my class because <laughs> that's <laughs> what it is for me. And as I said at the very beginning of our little chat today, like you coming so regularly puts the mirror to me and it's just like Thank you. helped me be a better teacher on so many levels. So I'm grateful for the friendship. I'm grateful for you participating in the training and this little chat. Thank you so much, Purusha. Thank you, Jay. I do, and I'm very honored to hear what you're saying. Um, yeah. It's really good. I, I love doing it. And I look forward to keep doing it for as long as whenever. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there. Thank you, sir. I'll be in touch with you. I'll see you soon, all right? Okay, thanks, Jay. Bye. Bye. Okay, if you can hear the sound of my voice, then that means the portal has successfully been opened and the time-space between us has been bridged. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. If this happens to be your first time here, welcome to you. Everyone else, what's up? Hope you had an okay week. Hope you are managing to maintain a sense of your humanity despite the increasingly dystopian future we seem to be entering into. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had some very triggering events this week. First, I had to take a trip to the Apple store. I, I couldn't wait any longer. I had to up upgrade my wife and my phones. We had six S's, y'all. We had to update from 6S to 13s. And oh my gosh, what an experience that was. I think if you, if you have updated your phone on a kind of regular basis over the years, every year, a couple years or something, it's probably not as bad. But when you have such a break in between where you've not experienced the processes that they have and how the phones are and all the different things that have changed with them. 
Oh man, it was so so obvious that uh, we're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I also had a conversation with my eldest daughter, who is turning 13 in like another week. We had a conversation about Neuralink, about putting chips in your body. So it's a bit of a rabbit hole, longer conversation. Maybe we'll have some of it on the other side of today's conversation. If you want to stick around, I'll, I'll say something more about our dystopian future and how we might resist it. <laughs> I would first want us to listen to today's talk with Richard Rosen, because I think it might offer us something that would be helpful in this regard, actually. I did not know Richard at all, but I've certainly known of him. He's been around since I first got into yoga, and he's good friends with Rodney Yee. We talk about Rodney some, and it was really quite wonderful to connect with him because he is someone who has managed to keep his teaching going and vibrant for himself and people who practice with him over so many years and through some considerable health challenges that we also discuss. So I certainly took a lot of inspiration from having a chance to talk to him, and I'm very glad to be sharing it with you today. Real quick before we get to that, I want to say thanks to our podcast premium subscribers. Shows like this don't survive without people supporting it, and people who subscribe to Podcast Premium are really lifeblood of this venture. So today I specifically want to shout out Leslie Carson and Beverly Martin, both longtime supporters. Thanks, Leslie and Beverly. Really appreciate it. And if you have been listening to this show and you want to get access to the full archives and be a supporter... The way you do that is you become a podcast premium subscriber. It's choose your rate, cancel at any time. And if you don't have money and there's an old episode that you want to listen to, just email us and we'll hook you up. But if you have even just a little something to give, it makes a difference. And we're very grateful to everyone who's doing that. To learn more about becoming a podcast premium subscriber, along with all my other stuff, my training and my weekly ongoing classes and all my stuff. Everything can be found at jbrownyoga.com. All right, y'all. Like I said, we'll touch base on the other side. But for now, let's go ahead and listen to this conversation that I had with Richard Rosen. Hello. Hello. Hi, Richard. I'm Jay. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Let me just mention right off the bat that I'm already recording. I don't know if you've listened to the show before. I think you have. I have, yes, indeed. So I'd like to consider us having just begun. And I'm really grateful to you. I really, I'm really appreciative that you decided to go ahead and do this with me. And I'm just the grateful for your time. Thank you for it. Well, you're very kind to ask me. I thank you. Well, you're somebody I've wanted to actually speak to for quite some time. I think I might have mentioned this to you in like an initial invitation, although I'm not sure because, frankly, I originally reached out to you some while back through your website and never heard from you. I don't pay much attention to my website as much as, as, much as I should. <laughs> well, but it ended up being like through another episode of the show, and we'll get to that, where I mentioned Yogi Ramacharaka and uh, our mutual friend at the Bamboo Leaf Press got us into touch. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I, in any case, what I was going to say is I got handed your book on pranayama I believe it was by Jonathan Satin in, in London in 2000. Oh, Jonathan, yeah. And he said, uh, I think Richard is somebody you'd want to talk to. And so I, I've been wanting to talk to you for some time. So I'm glad to finally get the chance. Well, thank you very much. I'm very, I'm very flattered. Cool. Well, before we get to the book in Ramacharaka, I did, I was just curious to um, pick your brain a little bit because I, 
I came into yoga here on the East Coast in the New York scene. And I've had folks on who've talked about the West Coast. Sean Korn talked about going from the East Coast to the West Coast. Mm. And it's my impression that you were you were kind of came up on the West Coast. I saw in your bio that you you were involved at the Piedmont Yoga Center with Rodney Yee. Rodney, yes. And, you know, that's another thing. Like, Rodney is somebody I've been trying to get on the show since I started, and he doesn't seem to want to come on. So if Rodney listens to this, or you can put in a good word for me. <laughs> <laughs> I will indeed. But I saw in your bio that you actually specifically – joked you wrote that you you think of him as your evil twin and i was curious where that came from well we have i've known i met rodney in 1982 when we were in the training program at the at the Angry institute in san francisco and we hit it off right away and um it's i hope everybody in has in their lives a friend like rodney because he's he's just a, he's a marvelous person uh you know he, we, we we dovetail with each other really well it's a, one of the unfortunate things he lives out on the East Coast, but we we're in contact pretty pretty consistently. We send each other our poetry and little clips from video uh, from YouTube that we think we, we each other would like. Mm. So Rod and I, uh, Rod and I have a, a long history together, and I'm really pleased that he's been my been my friend all these years. And what was the like origins of the Piedmont Yoga Center? How were you involved with it? Huh. Well, Rod, it was all Rodney's idea and came up to you one day and we, we just finished our, we finished a program in, in like 1983 or four. And he said, let's open a yoga school. You know, it's like one of those Mickey Rooney things where he says, let's, let's, let's put on a, let's put on a show. And I, I thought he was, I thought he was nuts. Um, I mean, I didn't have any real much experience as a teacher, but Rodney, Rodney never doubted himself as a teacher. And he, he, he was, he was, he was raring to go and to spread the word, spread the gospel. So he found the place in Oakland, and uh, he talked me into it, and <laughs> and uh, we had a we had a pretty good run. We had twenty five year run with Piedmont Yoga. Uh, it, it was a good school. We 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 did a good job with that one. And I guess so. Had you not already been teaching before that center opened? Yeah, a little bit here and there, mostly subbing. I, I didn't have any. I, uh, I didn't have. I, mean, I can't. Uh, I was teaching lawyers and uh, i was teaching disabled people and just here and there was you know it was just it was the old days when you started out a yoga, as a yoga teacher you needed a car and a, and a, and a bag full of props to get around <laughs> so i was i was all over the place and uh, i didn't have a really uh, i don't remember if i was teaching at the yoga room or not at that time but um rodney rodney uh, rodney talked me into it and i went along and we we uh, we did well together we only had a few fights i mean there was it. Well, well, wait a second. We'll get to the fights. No, no, no. <laughs> but I was, no, no, I was no, going to no. say, I was going to say, like in in the eighties in Los Angeles, I was a kid growing up in the San Fernando Valley, so yeah. it was just not. There wasn't like yoga centers in the way that we kind of think of no. it now, or that we did no. before everything went away. But like, it was just a couple of teachers teaching out of their living rooms, or like you, and especially in LA, having to drive everywhere with your props in the trunk. That's funny. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, there, there, when we started Piedmont Yoga, there was maybe one or two other yoga schools in the East Bay. That was it. Now you know there's dozens probably. Right. But, um, there wasn't. There wasn't. There were, in San Francisco. There was hardly anything that anything to any, any kind of uh, schools either. The, you know, the Iron Institute was pretty much it. Right. And so you two met at a training at the Iyengar Institute. Is that what you yes, said? Yes, it was a two year training. Two years. So was that? I mean, back in the day, I remember even when I showed up in like early 90s <clears throat> there wasn't all these 200 hour trainings no. a young guy was kind of the gold standard it it took two yeah. years and you had to like jump through a lot of hoops if i recall a lot of really high hoops yeah um yeah yeah that was that was that was the way it was in those days there was no there were no quickie uh the trainings you had to, you had to put some time in it took me two and a half or three years to finish the program and so when you two opened the piedmont yoga center is that like cool? Is it in a young Iyengar center or? Do you well, guys... we were neither, neither neither one of us were certified as Iyengar teachers, and we, we you, you weren't really allowed to call yourself that, um, you know, as in, uh, you, if you weren't certified by somebody. So even after two years, even after two years, you're not certified. Well, you have to go. You have to. You, 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 it's not like you pat yourself on the head and say I'm certified. Um, you have to. You have to go to go in front of a a panel of teachers and and 
do your thing and they'll, they, they would, they approve you or not. Mm. And, you know, I, I, I was like, I was more like WC Fields. I wouldn't want to be a member of a club than anybody that, that, uh, that would have me as a member. <laughs> yeah, I never, yeah. I never got certified. Neither did Rod. But I think Rod went off to India a couple of times to study with Mr. Iyengar. Right. Instead of going through the certifying process or whatever, huh? Go straight yeah. to the man himself, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Rodney, Rodney, uh, Rodney never doubted himself as a yoga teacher. He, um, of all the teachers I know, he's probably the most competent, um, the most, what can I say? He fits into the being a yoga teacher as, be, as best, as, as well as anybody I know. Well, I consider him and like Lilius Folan, the two people I haven't ever been able to get on the show. I've oh, been Lilius. in contact with both of them before and they were going to do it and it didn't happen. But to both of them were just such, they had such an impact. Like, yeah, Lilius for sure. I, I always Lilius. ask people like, what was your first yoga experience? And it was like, one of uh, Rodney's DVDs or Lilius's on PBS, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> or Richard Hittleman's book, you know? Oh my, yeah. Richard Hittleman, for sure. Because <laughs> I met Lilius one time in Cincinnati, I believe it was. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice person. All right. So 25 years at the Piedmont Center, was that like your only gig? Did you make a living from that? Or did you have like other stuff that you had to do to pay your way? Well, um, uh, what do you mean by a living? Uh, yeah, I, I uh, <laughs> eventually made a living. Uh, that was my only gig. Um, I, from 1987 on, I've been a, a regular, uh, a full-time teacher. And you know, at first, um, you know, it was it was it was a bit of a struggle financially, but things picked up after a while. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I'm I'm pretty comfortable with what I've done over the years. And I guess. I'm curious about that because starting as early as you did yeah. and kind of having like a, a nest like that, you know, cause I had a place for 10 years before I couldn't keep up with the rent anymore in Brooklyn, yeah. Yeah. but to have like a home base, you're kind of able to watch everything play out. Cause you've got your own spot and things just really went mainstream. That was kind of the thing. Rodney, Rodney was a big part of that. He mainstreamed it. You know, his videos, he made tons of videos. So was the center like once, do you remember like when the center started, was he as well known? Like he hadn't <laughs> had like video distribution yet or anything. Rodney, Rodney was popular from day one. I remember before we opened the school, he used to teach people in his, in his living room or his dining room, whatever it was in his, in his house. And he went out of town one time and he asked me to sub for him. And I went over to this place and the, the place was packed. I mean, there must have been 20 people in the room. I never had a class that big in front of me ever before. It was, it was, it was quite an eye opener. So he, he was, he was, he was, he was right on from day one. I see. And did you have a very different teaching style than him or was it similar? Was it, <laughs> I, were you guys teaching Iyengar or what were you guys doing back when you first started it? Rodney teaches Rodney Yee. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Fair enough. No, he, I mean, he, 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 he knows his Iyengar, uh, his, his, his Iyengar pretty well, but I mean, he, he's not afraid to put something of, a, of himself in, into the, into the practice and into the teaching. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you know, you, you, you get a full spectrum of, of practice when you, when you, when you take classes abroad and Colleen, you know. Well, what about you? What about me? Yeah. What about you? What about your teaching? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm certainly, uh, I certainly have been influenced very strongly by the Iyengar people. Um, and, um, at first I, you know, you, when you, when you, when you do Iyengar, uh, uh, yoga, you have to be loyal to that practice. You don't really add stuff onto it. No, that's, that's sort of anathema. Mm -hmm. So I, stayed, least, I mean, that's changing some, but yes, yeah, back in the day for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You, you just had, you know, if you were, if you were disloyal, you were excommunicated pretty quickly. Mm. So, I mean, I was pretty, I was pretty straightforward Iyengar for a while, but I've, I've, you know, I've, lo I've loosened up over the years a little bit anyway. I see. And, but most of the time you really did stick to the method. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 I think it's a really good, it's a good, it's a good approach in, in many ways. I mean, the way, the way it's presented oftentimes is, is, is a little bit, a little bit <laughs> off putting, I guess. Well, I guess but, that's, I mean, that would be another question of mine because I've talked to a bunch of different people who are, I don't know how much they identify as being in Iyengar community or not, but I hear like in the early days, 
things were much less standardized. I even remember somebody telling me, you know, I did jump back sun salutations with Mr. Iyengar. And I was like, <laughs> what? Like that, nobody ever heard of that before. But yeah. apparently as time went on, things got more codified and standardized. Did you observe that happen? Yes. He, he became more, he, he became more concerned with preserving his, his, his legacy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I have a, I have a, a, a interview with him. That people were showing him different kinds of poses, different variations. And he was going, well, that's not Iyengar yoga. You can't talk. You can't do that. And, I mean, it became very, it became very, I don't want to use the word rigid, but it became very, very settled after a while. Mm. And I mean, in your practice, again, in your teaching over the years, did, did things change or did you kind of find your thing and stick with it? Well, I think it's important for every yoga teacher to find their own voice after a while. I mean, it's like, it's like, it's like anything else, like a painter, you, you want to copy the, the good ones at first, Picasso, whatever you're doing. And, but eventually you want to, you want to, you want to strike out on your own and, and show what you, what you've got inside yourself. So uh, yeah, I, I, I hope that I've been able to do that. Um, I, I try anyway to, 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 to put a little bit of myself into the, into the teaching. Well, also maybe beyond just like putting yourself into it and we can get to that. I'm kind of curious even more just about the practicalities of it. Like I mentioned to you that my introduction to you really was somebody handing me your book on Pranayama, which I believe was your first book. Is that right? Uh, which book on Pranayama? Is that the Yoga of Breath? Is that, that's the one you had? I think so, Or There was There's two books, actually. There's a Yoga of Breath and there's Pranayama Beyond the something or other. Oh, I got the Pranayama Beyond something or other. Yeah, that's the, that's the more, that's the second Pranayama book. Oh. Actually, there's a, there, there was a book before that that I, that I wrote for something called Ulysses Press, and it was called Yoga for 50 Plus. Oh, okay. Well, that's funny because that actually answered my question because I, I was sort of searching around to learn a little bit about you before I talked to you today. And it seemed like I thought what your first book was a book on pranayama. And I was going to ask, oh, why, why would you do pranayama first? That's not usually the first book. Usually the first book is like yoga for 50 plus. <laughs> but that's, yeah. that was your first one, huh? <laughs> they told me I was going to make a lot of money with that book if I wrote it a certain way. And so I did and it didn't make any money at all. So I, mm. I, I've decided to write books my way from now on after that. Right. Yes. I know a few people who that's happened to who had editors who had influence on their books yeah. because they told them it would sell more, but it didn't sell more. <laughs> that's exactly what happened to my, to my first Pranayama book. Uh, the, 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 um, the publisher I was contracted with gave the book to a, um, an editor that started to rewrite the book. And I, I, you know, I made a little fuss over that and that, that got me, that, that got me excommunicated from that publisher. She just dropped me. Mm. Well, that's interesting to me that your practice or that what you were teaching was Iyengar method, but the book that you really wanted to write was about pranayama because I don't know. I have never got a lot of pranayama instruction in Iyengar classes, mostly alignment stuff. In fact, I remember, I, I remember our younger teachers telling me not to do ujjayi or like just no. natural belly breathing. So where did that, where does that come for you? Where does that uh, interest or uh, writing about pranayama come in for you? Well, Mr. Iyengar does have a book on pranayama. And, true, um, true, true. But it wasn't and, in the classes uh, or was it? Was it in the classes? Well, in, 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 our, in, our, in, in the classes I took at the Iyengar Institute, the teacher I had, the last, the last class of every month was a pranayama class. Mm. every month so um I, I i don't remember exactly why i got started on it but i i was told that it was that, that, that for a complete uh, a yoga practice formal practice you needed to have a pranayama practice included in that mm. so i took that at, 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 at its word and i i just started uh, practicing pranayama every day and it, it was kind of unusual i, I started teaching uh, workshops on pranayama, which was uh, which was which were very poorly attended over the years, <laughs> still are to a certain extent. But I I I, I built up a, a stack of um, notes about well how you know the the, the um, how what I did and how it worked and what the students' responses were to it, and so I had a lot of material um, for 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 a book, and uh, I I I I was contacted to to, to write a, to write that book. By, by, by a press booth. I won't, I won't give the name, but no. so that's how that came around. 
And I guess I always think about pranayama techniques like there's they're pretty diverse. There's sort of like the more purgative, like Kapalabhati techniques. Yeah. And then, you know, I'm a big I'm influenced a lot by Deska Char teachings, which there's often a lot of Ujjayi pranayama emphasis there. Mm. Are there particular techniques that you you hold dear most? Well, my 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 pranayama practice has completely changed over the years. I'm not even sure people would consider pranayama anymore. Why do you say um, that? Well, I don't I don't really need I don't really teach a lot of the um, the um, you know the fancy techniques that n- manipulating the nostrils and things like that. I'm I'm more involved with right now with with breath awareness. Mm. And um, I, I, pay, I pay a lot of, I, I spend a lot of time teaching my, my students I, the, to touch various places in their torso to feel the breath moving into there. And um, just watching the breath, I think is very important. Getting, getting acquainted with your breath. And, uh, you know, I, I do teach a little, I do teach some pranayama techniques, but nothing very, nothing very difficult. It's basically watching your breath. I do some Veloma and some Ujjayi. Um, and that's about it. I, I don't really feel like it's useful to teach more advanced practices to people who don't practice every day. It just doesn't make any sense to do that. So I keep it pretty simple because I know most of my students don't practice practice every day. Interesting. But even if they did, like, I mean, I've done both. I've done like daily Kapalabhati practices Mm. and then also more like what you're talking about, which I'm very intrigued by Richard, that, that, that idea of touch your body and can you, feel or have awareness of your breath there like Mm -hmm. that doesn't sound like a young art method to me (laughs) no that's but that's what i do now it's uh, (laughs) see but that's an evolution that's from where we started in piedmont yeah 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 that's for sure well yeah i mean uh if if you're still doing the same practice you were doing 10 years ago you haven't you haven't made much progress so um so i I really go ahead um, no i was going to ask is so when when does that, when do you start to move away from a more asana focus? Do you remember? Well, I, I haven't really moved away from asana either. I mean, I, I think it's, uh, the, the asana is uh, it's a very important part of, of the practice. And it's, it's, it's sort of the, the sort of the platform on which you, you build a pranayama practice. Mm. All right. Well, that's yeah. interesting. So it's not that you don't use asana. It's just, but again, like that idea of pranayama, I guess you do still teach like alignment in your in your asana class oh, absolutely well. yeah i don't teach i i don't i don't call i get i get asked every now and then to teach breathing practices to like uh you know workers in, a, in, a, in some i, I did a, i did a little a thing at stanford a few weeks ago with a wellness program there and I, I don't really want to call what i teach in those kinds of situations pranayama because i don't really i don't really think you can really do a decent pranayama practice without having some asana practice in in, in the background so I just call it conscious breathing. I see. Well, I mean, breathing practices. Pranayama, I guess the word is fancy and really yeah, it's just yeah. breathing, right? And it's it's off putting too to a lot of people. Yeah, I guess you gotta know know who you're teaching to and yeah. And I agree you would you'd want to present it in a way that makes it seem accessible, right? Absolutely, yeah, really. Well, I guess the other thing that I'm curious about is and I mentioned this before is that we we come together some because I was talking on the podcast about Yogi Ramacharaka. Yeah. And, you know, that um, that series of books, and in particular, the 14 Lessons in Yogi Philosophy, Yeah, that was such an important book to me. Like, it was, I found it at, like, a bookstore within, like, the first two months of, like, seriously starting to go to yoga classes every day. I just happened upon that book. And I guess I've been thinking about it a lot of late because over the last few years, especially, the thing that I've become most interested in are what I kind of sometimes call like the subtler aspects or the contemplative aspects of yoga, where, you know, we're living in a consciousness-based reality. Mm. Uh, And that book was something that planted a lot of seeds in me that still seem to blossom from time to time. Mm-hmm. And so I guess I'm curious, how did, had you heard of those books before you were asked to write that introduction to them? Uh, many, many years ago, I was, 
contracted to write a book on yoga, modern yoga, yoga in the United States. And I fell upon, I came upon um, all these different people who were teaching yoga a, a long, long time ago in the early days, in the early, early days of yoga in the West. And I happened upon a William Atkinson who, whose pen name was Yogi Charaka, uh, Ch- uh, Ramacharaka. Mm-hmm. And I was fascinated by, 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 by Atkinson. He was a prolific writer. He wrote over a hundred books on a variety of topics. And he wrote under a different num- number of different kinds of uh, uh, pen, uh, pen names. Y- uh, Yogi Ramacharaka wasn't the only one. Mm-hmm. So I, I was more interested, not so much in, 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 in what he wrote for y- uh, under that pen name, but what, what he was doing as, as, as in his whole, in his whole writing career. Mm-hmm. And he was, he, he, um, he he was a, he was he was one of the first uh, writers that I know that wrote a book on hatha yoga, mm-hmm. and it didn't have pictures of poses really in it. It was all no, like no, about no, no like pictures. the different systems of the body, the the system of elimination. I remember it like it. Yeah, it was a different idea, and also at the beginning of that hatha yoga book, it actually said something about mendicants on the street performing tricks and that's not what hatha yoga is about yes. you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> even in the early 1900s or whatever somebody was writing that right yeah that book came out in 1904 or 5 i think the book on hatha yoga that he wrote it was, it was a pretty interesting book i mean i have to say to me even like the story in the in the book like that they talk about this i mean you say it was atkinson and i guess in the introduction you wrote you did bring up the question that I raised on this show, which is, do we know that it's Atkinson? Because honestly, I, in my own, just for whatever, my own inquiry, I read all the Ramacharaka books. And then I read some of the stuff that it seems like you read too, in terms of like, oh, it's actually Atkinson. He writes under these different names. So I read a bunch of his books too. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me like, they didn't seem like the same author. Like I thought there was something really different about the writing in between them. And I always kind of thought, well, it it could be that there was actually some teacher there. And so the last, the only two times I've ever raised this on the show and I've asked it, both people were like kind of scholars and they both said immediately, no, 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 everybody knows the guy didn't exist. It was just a pseudonym. But you seem to leave the question open in your introduction. Well, there was a whole story behind. I don't. I don't recall right now off the top of my head. But there was a whole story about uh, about Yogi Ramacharak and and how. And how mm-hmm. he, uh, and yes, I and his student was what Baba Barata, I believe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like that's that. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. nobody knows who he was, and no, that, that's right. Uh, yeah, I remember that now. So yeah, I uh, there. There's that. There's that story. But I think that was that was I mean, my, my feeling is that that was put up as a front to make the, to make the to make the the books more legitimate that the yoga books more legitimate mm-hmm. because they were written by a westerner i see i mean that's the case but i guess getting into what the books actually say like if we whether whoever wrote it or whatever they wrote it about i mean well let me also mention because it's sort of a strange note that the story goes that these were like lessons that were given at the world's fair right um that's the, the uh, well. That's the, the story. Fair, that's the myth. Well, right? I think Atkinson was in was living in Chicago in 1893, mm. and there was there was this. I, I ran across some uh, references that that Vivekananda was probably might have been one of his uh, instructors, which doesn't seem doesn't seem really possible. Mm. So I mean. I, I, I really don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's no way. I know. To I, I know. He, I know. He was living in Chicago. He was big in the new in the new um, new, new, new thought movement. Right. In, right. In, in, in the late in the late 1890s. Yeah, I just think it to me the kind of like story of like these lessons be given, and if any and if anybody ever takes some time to actually do a little reading into the World's Fair, it's weird. There's a lot of weird stuff about the World's I, Fair. I have a whole thing on the World's Fair that I, that I, I when I was writing this book on the Yoga in America, you know, Vivekananda was was the first uh, big yogi to come to, the, to this country to speak, and he spoke at the Parliament of Religion, of uh, World Religion, that, that, that was part of the World's Fair. And I, I did some digging into that World's Fair. It was a pretty amazing place, or, or, or event, I should say. 
Well, I know. Like supposedly they erected the cities for. I mean, it's crazy. yeah, the white city, it's yeah, the wild, white city. wild stuff. And, but, and so I, I've always kind of had a little bit of a romantic thing around that story. But I, I accept that it might be made up, yeah. <laughs> as a lot of stories of in the yoga lore over the years have Absolutely. sometimes been proven to be the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Absolutely. I guess what I what I would say is that the actual content of that book is very interesting to me to interesting to me too. And sometimes yeah. I feel like the books get vilified like oh it's new thought it's all bullshit. Yeah. But a lot of that does seem rooted in yoga philosophy even if it it's not like citing its sources and it certainly seems like kind of like a compilation maybe of coming from different kinds of ideas. But well, I actually found a lot of it very empowering. In those days they uh, well, Vivekananda did this too. He sort of he sort of watered down his, his teaching to make it more acceptable to Westerners. Mm. Uh, you know, that, that, that may have been what, what, uh, what uh, Char, uh, Atkinson did too. There, there is a question though, of where he got his information from, how he, how he learned about yoga. That's never been really settled how he, how he, how he learned about the practice. Right. So we don't actually know where his sources are, but no, you know, like a lot of this stuff in terms of just like the nature of mind and like, thoughts as forms and kind of like resonance and vibratory qualities. And mm. I mean, a lot of it is very interesting stuff to me. I guess I'm curious about that. You've been, as you said, a yoga teacher for many, many years in your experience. Do you, do you, I don't even know how to say it. Like the question I've been asking a lot these days is around like a higher power or even like kind of a feeling of prayer in a sense. Cause I feel like for a while yoga got real, like we didn't do the chanting and we talked more about functional movement or something. Mm -hmm. And more recently as things have gotten more siloed and more like, I don't know, sincere in certain ways, uh, uh, myself and a lot of other teachers I know have kind of gone back to like devotional qualities more chanting again and stuff and i'm kind of curious in your practice and your teaching of yoga has has there been like a devotional element you mentioned poetry that could be it maybe it's there <laughs> not in my poetry though <laughs> <laughs> i uh, see uh my, my i wrote i write poetry it's called uh children's poetry for adults um i um i, I don't well uh, you know i try to put some if you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.